serenity, happiness. In terms of summing up what we're all looking for, can you think of two better words? Serenity, calm heart, happiness, smiling face. We might look different places, in different ways, but we're all looking for serenity, happiness. And these are the bookends of the prayer we've been studying by Reinhold Niebuhr. Let's read it one last time. We close out the series. He writes, God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is. Not as I would have. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in the next. Uh, we think of supreme happiness, supreme serenity, serenity, if there was ever a place where these two would seem to have been safeguarded, where you'd expect to find them, it would be in the Garden of Eden. Interestingly, even there, serenity and happiness slipped away. In a perfect world, paradise lost. In a perfect world, paradise lost. Let's inspect the wreckage briefly, and I'm going to read some portions, and let's try to determine what happened. When did they leave and how did they leave? Um, I'm just going to read just three short passages from Genesis. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And that's in Genesis 2. And then we go a few verses, and this just seems to be just Adam and God. And then it says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For she was taken out of man. And then they connect and they live together, they find in one another the companionship that they've wanted, and then in chapter 3, the serpent shows up and speaks to the woman. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Something was lost in the translation. When God talks to Adam, he says, you must not eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by the time we hear from Eve, she says, it goes from that to you must not touch it. I watched Columbo last night. Everybody, Columbo, you know that? The rumpled, rumpled thing. And, he, and he's, oh, yeah, one more question. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it true that God said to Adam, um, you must not eat fruit from the tree? And, and what, one question, what was it that Eve said? You must not touch it. Um, why the fence law? That's not what God said to Adam. So where did Eve get that? That's a good question, don't you think? Good question. God was pretty clear with Adam. Don't eat. And Eve said not only not eat, but don't touch. Um, what happened? I think something got lost in the translation. 
I think Adam felt insecure. And he wanted to protect Eve from even getting close to the tree. So what did he do? He put a fence law around it. The real law was don't eat. You know what a fence law is? So that you don't even get close to not eating. Don't even touch the tree. But God didn't say that. He said don't eat. Why the fence law? Why a fence law? What was he protecting? Who was he protecting? He was protecting Eve. Who was he protecting Eve from? God. Protecting Eve from God? Insecurity? Yeah, I think so. Um, and then, um, and it says, you shot... Surely not die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know what? Insecurity is infectious. Insecurity is infectious. Um, it goes from, we can't touch the tree, and then it becomes, you know, God doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. And then she sees the tree, and it's good for wisdom, and she wants to eat the fruit, um, cursory examination of what happens in the world, in the garden blames the woman. Deeper inspection reveals that before sin entered and happiness exited, serenity had already left. When did serenity leave the Garden of Eden? Apparently sometime between when Adam was told and Eve was told. Because it was a lack of serenity that caused Adam to be able to say, Eve, don't even touch the tree. You know why? Because I'm concerned that if you eat it and that you're gone, I'm going to be alone again. And I don't want to experience that. I don't want to do without you. So, Serenity had already left. And interestingly, serenity left even before human sin poisoned the human mind. Doubts about God's character took root first in Adam and then in Eve. So, here's what we find in the Garden of Eden. Interestingly, the exit of happiness was preceded by the entrance of sin. But, what we usually say, it was sin that caused it, wasn't it? The entrance of sin was preceded by the exit of serenity, unbelief. Um, now, we live east of Eden. And if serenity and happiness couldn't exist in the Garden of Eden, which chance do we have? We're in a tough place. We're in a tough spot. Things happen that we don't want to happen. We're threatened, like they weren't threatened in the Garden. Now human sin does infect the mind and the heart. And that makes it worse. It doesn't create the problem, but it certainly exacerbates it. Uh, happiness now is like mercury. You ever do that in school? Try to pick up mercury. You know, it slips around. You try to pick it up. It's hard to get a hold of. Happiness is like mercury. It's hard to get a hold of. You try to grab it, and what happens? You try to squeeze through your fingers. Um, what should we do then? How do we live east of Eden? You know, one of the guys who was in a place probably to experience as much of serenity and happiness as anybody that has ever walked the planet, uh, was Solomon. Solomon lived at a time when Israel was powerful, and he was wise. He was wise. So he had the luxury of being able, during peacetime, to explore all kinds of paths to serenity and pleasure. And good news for us, he ended up writing some notes. And it comes to us as the biblical book of Ecclesiastes, which he penned. And so we can learn from his pursuit of serenity and happiness to try to find out um, what he found out and learn from his example. Um, what it says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2, Solomon writes, I wanted to see was what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the first during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks 
and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work. And this was the reward for all my labor. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Serenity and happiness are what we look for. We look in different ways. Um, some of us focus relationally. Calmness and happiness come with making a connection. Some of us, that's really what does it. Sitting down, connecting with family, connecting with friends, forging an interrelational bond. Ah, that's it. Some of us, we focus vocationally. We try to be productive. Calmness and happiness comes with making a difference. Creating something, producing something, getting something done. Some of us are more task-focused. Some of us are more people-focused. How many of you would say, if you had to choose one or the other, task-focused versus people-focused, how many of you would say, eh, Mike, I think I probably am more people-focused than task-focused. People-focused? Okay. Task-focused? How many of you would you say, oh, not even. Oh, yeah. um, Solomon's search for happiness led him down both roads. Pleasure, in terms of connection, productivity, gardens, and study, and all kinds of stuff. It turned out to be a chasing after the wind. He said, yes, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. He went as far down the road to productivity and people as anyone is ever going to go. He had unlimited resources, the opportunity, and the power, and the resources to be able to travel farther down the road of productivity and people than you and I will ever do. And yet, what he comes to the end of that road, he it's not what he imagined it would be. Uh, he comes up with an assessment in Ecclesiastes 5. It's in your worship hall. The moreover, he says, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot, and be happy in his work. This is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Reasonable happiness is pretty subjective, isn't it? What would you need to be happy? Reasonably happy. Reasonable happiness for one person isn't the same as reasonable happiness for another. Some of us can be reasonably happy with a constellation of relationships. Some of us can be reasonably happy with an accumulation of accomplishments, different levels. We're all looking for the same thing, though. And our search at the Garden of Eden leads us to wonder, I wonder if we're going to find what we're looking for. In the Garden of Eden, serenity and happiness are siphoned away. Solomon has all the resources to be able to pursue those in spades, and he comes up kind of empty. Uh, we might reason, you know what the problem is? Unrealistic expectations. We just expect too much of life. You know, we got to moderate our expectations. Or we need to work on people to get them to live in light of our expectations. We either have to change what we want, our will, or we have to change what they decide, their won't. So we influence our will or their won't to try to bring this into play because when people are doing what we want them to do and we have mostly what we want to have, we approach serenity and calmness. Um, interestingly, uh, Solomon puts a, a snag. He says this in Ecclesiastes 3. I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. 
There is a burden that God has laid on men, and it's on you. There's a burden you deal with. And it's one that God laid on you. And he understands it. And he knows that it feels like a weight. He understands it. And this is the burden. He has made everything beautiful in its time. But he has set eternity in our hearts. And we cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He has made everything beautiful in its time. The problem is times change. It's nice to see trees. It's nice to see leaves. But the leaves are going to fall, and they are going to collect on my lawn and in my gutters and in your gutters, and that's just the way things are. Things are beautiful, but then, well, here's what Solomon said. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born a time to die. Time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent. A time to speak. A time to love. And a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. There are beautiful things to want. The problem is not that we want them, but that they we want them and they don't remain. Things decay. Beauty fades. Health leaves. People die. God knows that this is a burden. He understands there's something in us that cannot tolerate this decay, this death. There's a biological clock within us that's turned to eternity. And when we see things passing away, there's something about us when we are at a funeral. Roger Fredrickson passed away and funeral, Joel's grandfather just then. We look at and come to and where did he go? There's something about us that says people don't just disappear. And we get that sense when we're at a funeral, when we're at a viewing, especially. What happened? What happened? People don't just leave. Where'd he go? And that's the burden because at some we are tuned into eternity. And questions like that at funerals are appropriate. Our hearts can appreciate beauty and long for eternity. Our hearts are Human minds cannot grasp divine purposes. I don't care how much you know about God. We cannot understand what God has done from beginning to end. I want you to listen. I want you to listen. We're tuned into eternity, but we cannot understand what God has done from beginning to end. So, if we're basing our serenity and our happiness on being cued in to understanding exactly what God is doing, we will not be serene or calm. Because the fact is, we cannot track with God. Can't do it. Can't do it. His brain's big. So we just It's just not going to work. Um, we can try to change our inner world to find serenity. We can try to change our outer world to find serenity, but... As we said in the garden, even a mind untainted by sin still is going to have problems with serenity and happiness. Okay, look in. That's what Solomon does. And it seems like biblically when it says about happiness, look out. Reasonable happiness is a subjective term. It's also a moving target. I think I've shared this before, but uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, he came to America in uh, right before the Civil War. And this is what he did. He wrote a two-volume work, Democracy in America. And here's the reason why he wrote this. Two-volume work. Why the Americans are so restless in the midst of their prosperity. That's what he came. How can a people who have so many things be so restless, be so 
lacking serenity be so lacking happiness? How can that be? And here's uh, some quotes. Here's what he said. In America, I saw the freest and most enlightened men placed in the happiest circumstances that the world affords. It seemed to me as if a cloud habitually hung over their brow, and I thought them serious and almost sad, even in their pleasures. And interesting. He goes on, a native of the United States clings to this world's goods as if he were certain never to die. He is so hasty in grasping at all within his reach that one would suppose he was constantly afraid of not living long enough to enjoy them. He clutches everything. He holds nothing fast, but so loosens his grasp, grasp to pursue fresh gratifications. And he closes. He who has his heart set exclusively of, upon the pursuit of worldly welfare is always in a hurry. But he has but a limited time at his disposal to reach, to grasp, and enjoy it. That was before the Civil War. Now we live on the far side of uh, World War II. In World War II, most places on the planet were devastated. In America, we weren't. We, had, we lost many lives. But in terms of having a war on our soil, it didn't really happen. And you know what we're able to do then? We're able to tune factories and repurpose them. And what we created in the wake of World War II is the suburbs. The suburbs. Time-saving devices cropped up in the late 50s, early 60s, homes, suburbs, time-saving devices. And you know what ended up happening? And Tom Brokaw and the Greatest Generation talked about the pre-World War II generation, the pursuit of happiness was corporate. The pursuit of happiness is something that was for more than just me. The pursuit of happiness was corporate. And progressively over the last 50 years, you know what the pursuit of happiness has come to be? Private. What's good for me and my 2.5 kids? I can have my Facebook page exactly like I want it. I can have this exactly like I want it, that exactly like I want it. And, and now the pursuit of happiness is private. And Alexis de Tocqueville said, that's a tough catch because happiness is like mercury. The more you try to pursue it and grasp it, the more it slips through your fingers. Um, we assume in our time, again, I'm with you, that God wants us to be pleased, doesn't he? God wants us to be pleased. You know, it's interesting. The Bible has some things to say, some grave things to say about the pursuit of pleasure. Look what it says in 2 Timothy. We'll balance this out, but Paul says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, I'm sorry, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. In the last days, here's the questions. Will it benefit me? Will it bring me money? Will it give me pleasure? I wonder where I should live. Will it benefit me? Will it bring me money? Will it give me pleasure? I wonder where I should go to church. Will it benefit me? Will it bring me money? Will it give me pleasure? I wonder where I should hang around. I wonder what career I should have. I wonder what I should do next year. Will it benefit me? Will it bring me money? Will it give me pleasure? You know what the deal is? The road to pleasure and the road to God, they intersect. There are things when we follow God that are pleasurable and happy. However, it seems to indicate lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Is it saying then that the roads to pleasure and God intersect but they do not converge? Would you agree with me? The roads to God and pleasure intersect 
They do not converge. The road to God and the road to pleasure will go off in different directions on this side of eternity. On the far side of eternity, there's only one road in heaven. Joy is the serious business of heaven, but this side. That's why Solomon encourages us to look up with what he says. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, before the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, before the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. What Solomon does, having expected and driven toward pleasure, he ends up saying this, uh, look out might not find what you're looking for and look up at some point because at some point you will and we will give up our spirit. We are spirit beings in mortal bodies. We really are spirit beings temporarily housed in a mortal body. And what happens at funerals, that's not really us. Part of us that defines us temporarily lives in this house. It's like a tent. If you've been camping, a tent is a decent place to spend a weekend, but you don't want to live there forever, do you? This is a tent. This is a temporary dwelling, a temporary abode, good for this side and necessary for this side. We can cultivate a connection with God in this place. And you know what we can do then? When we depart from this place, we go to be with him. When Jesus comes back a second time, our bodies and spirits will join. And at that time, when that occurs, if I run up into you in heaven, and I tell you, when Jesus has come, we're embodied spirit beings, eternal spirits, immortal bodies. And I'm going to say to you, Chuck, I want you to think of something sad. And, and you're going to say, I can't. I don't think, we're not going to be sad. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. There's no tears, though. There's no mourning. There's no weeping. There's no remorse. There's no resentment. There's no I should have, could have, would have, wish I had, all those things. You're not going to be able to pull them out of your consciousness. I don't know what it's going to be like. Talking last night, will we know one another? Yeah, I believe so. We talked about what it's going to be like. You know the image, the only one I have is fish. You take fish, flop it around in the shore, put it in the water. You ask that fish, how do you feel? What does the fish say? Happy, serene? You know what the fish says? Alive! That's what we're going to feel in heaven. We're going to feel alive. This is what I was made for. This is the thing that I always looked for. This is where I look. This is the serenity and the happiness that I always wanted but could never find. This is it! Now I know what I was looking for. That happens with him. Um, Serenity is a function of the grace God gives to lift this side of Eden, this side of eternity. Serenity is associated, interestingly enough, with these words according to this prayer. Grace, courage, wisdom, hardship, trust, acceptance and happiness. You know the Serenity Prayer was written by Reinhold Niebuhr in the middle of World War II. Before we created the suburbs, while numbers of Americans were being slaughtered, where we really didn't know what the future would hold. It wasn't a bright horizon we hoped we'd win. 
They were very testy times. Some of you lived through those times. I didn't. And that's when he wrote this prayer during World War II. What prayer? As a German pastor living in Massachusetts, the world falling down around our ears. God give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy forever with you in the next. Would you agree with me? Saying that prayer in the middle of 1940s and saying that prayer today is a little bit different. Would you agree with me? has a little more teeth then, a little more substance. Um, Elizabeth Sifton, Niebuhr's daughter, she wrote a book about her father's prayer called the Serenity Prayer. Here's what she says. All too often the Serenity Prayer has been construed as a way to say something clever about life's difficulties rather than as a true petition for grace and wisdom in an impossible world, though I think most AA members understand it rightly, and I would agree with them. Most AA members, they can look in their rearview mirror at the loss of some things. They understand their powerlessness. There's divorces in their rearview mirror, and the loss of children, the loss of vocation, difficult. And when they say the serenity prayer, some of you live by some teeth to it. She goes on, perhaps it's that for many people praying is a kind of reassuring pleasant activity which in itself they find soothing. She writes, the contribution and renunciation that one must experience to arrive at real hope or reassurance aren't part of the scheme. In an inanely immoral, frivolous, and profit-driven world, she writes, we may lose the ability to hear such a such a prayer. Um, where do we land with this? Look up. Interestingly, look what it says in 1 Peter 1. And it's pointing us to that time when Jesus will come a second time. If we have departed prior to then, if I have moved out of this temporary dwelling and have gone to be with him, when Jesus comes a second time, my body, that physical part of me that I left behind, will come up. It doesn't matter if it's cremated. God's not going to go, oh, he, did, he got cremated. Where is his ashes? <laughs> I hate it when they do this. Now I'm going to have to find that thing. No, it, it's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. It's, our body is going to come up, and the body and spirit are going to join one another, when, and what it's doing, and do you know that that's why Christ came? For God so loved you that he gave his one and only Son, that if you would believe in him, you wouldn't perish but have eternal existence, eternal life. And at that time, when Jesus comes a second time, and those of us who have already passed unite and those of us who are still here body and spirit you know, will be together with them. that's what it's talking about in terms of the focus and I'm going to tell you what it says that's the focus, you got that? when immortal spirits become connected to immortal bodies and we live in the form that Jesus lives in right now Jesus is an immortal spirit in an immortal body, correct? He came to the earth and he left bodily. And we're going to exist in the same way. He is the first of a new generation. 
eternal spirits and immortal bodies. Do angels have immortal bodies? Do they? They don't have bodies. Who has a body in heaven? Who's going to join them? Everybody who believes in him. Immortal spirits in immortal bodies. That's something wonderful. What it says? Now look at what this verse indicates in terms of looking at that. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. What is that saying? Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. When is your ship going to come in? When you find the right mate, when you find the right job, when you find the right house, when you find the right kids, when you find the right car, no, 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 no. When you have enough retirement, when you have enough money, when you have, no, no. You know, I'd say, I'm, there are things to enjoy. But ultimately, it says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given when Jesus is revealed. When those things pass, you leave this place and go to the place that you always had imagined. It's interesting to say, Mike, I'd like to do that. Um, there's something important if you kind of say, you know, Mike, frankly, and if, if we're honest with one another, from the way we think about God, some of us aren't really sure we want to go to be with him. Of course, we say we want to, because that would be bad if we didn't want to. Secretly, though, we really wonder. Is he going to show a highlight reel of all the things that we did, stupid things we did? I don't believe he will. You know what the problem with the Bible is? It's like a text. Have any of you ever misunderstood a text? Do you know what I mean? It was written in black and white, and you read an emotion into it that wasn't there. Have any have any of you ever done that? It seems so sharp. You said, why was he angry at me? And he, and then the person said, I wasn't angry when I sent that. What person, what? I, I, okay. What, here's what it says. Then the man and his wife, Genesis 3, in black and white, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. That's what he said. It's in black and white, three words. Where are you? Now we have to fill in the affect, don't we? We fill in the facial expression, just like a text. What do you think it's like? They're hiding in the garden. What is he doing? Some of us, we picture with a with a machete. Where are you? <laughs> I'll find you. You can't hide from me. Some of us aren't that. It's like we're all, <laughs> we've been God so broken hearted. He's so out of control. He just wanted the best for us, but it's not happening. Neither one. You know what God is like in that place? Direct, compassionate. He knows. You know what he says, Where are you? It's an invitation. Where are you? Come here. I'm the one you've been looking for. And all those places, and all those times. I'm the one you've been looking for. Where are you? Come here. You're not going to believe what I have in store for you. You're not going to believe it. You're going to be like a fish in water. And as obedient children, our word is, live in light of that time. Don't send your roots down too deep. 
ask the worship team to come up. Would you agree with me? Thinking of those things? Reasonably happy? You don't like everything in your life reasonably happy when you think that you will be supremely happy in the next. Yeah. <clears throat> Father, you know what our hearts are longing for. You understand us. I pray that you would give us the sense of uh, your character and your purposes. Increasingly, it doesn't happen all at once. We find ourselves dialing a little more towards eternity, a little less into now. It's not that we avoid now. We stick our head in the sand. It's not what we're supposed to do. There's things to take care of, things to do. But, and reasonable happiness, but not supreme. And when we kind of get the difference between that, we find ourselves being less driven, a little more gentle, a little more serene, a little more calm, a little more happy reasonably so. Continue to allow us to know you so that we would be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.